501, Treasure Island, by Robert Louis Stevenson. Book talk begins at 11 minutes. Welcome to Cracklit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 501. Arr. What's up? This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by guilt. <laughs> uh, that's funny because it's true. Well, hello. I have missed you. It has been ever so long, as you know, since I last got to a microphone, which is not for lack of trying. I have recorded twice in different places. The audio was so lousy. My grand scheme of being able to use one of the, I'm not kidding you, phone booths at work kind of fell by the wayside. So life has been rearranged. I think there is a way to work this out now. And I'm excited because I have actually been really wanting to get to the book that we are going to do next for quite some time. In fact, since a year ago, a little over a year ago, in Scotland. But before we get to the book, I feel like I need to catch you up on life. And that, of course, reminds me of Indigo Montoya in The Princess Bride. I need to explain. No, it's too much. I need to sum up. Because it's been a big year. As you know, I started a job almost exactly a year ago, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of a lot of work supporting a very active chief science officer and the science team. And that shows little sign of abating. We were thrown into a brand new tumult in January when the science team split offices with half in the original location and half in Philadelphia. We'll all be moving to Philadelphia come November. That was stressful and largely unplanned. It did get to the point where I looked at one of the guys who I work most closely with and said, we have had so many shoes drop on us, we could open a DSW. That it was just waiting for the next shoe to drop for about four months, actually. But that's calmed down and things are pretty good. We've all figured out trains and things like that. Trains are, in fact, the way that I'm going to be able to, at least in part, be able to prep for Treasure Island. Aha. So that part's good. Aaron, thing one, is now 19 years old and home from his first year of college for the summer and just a joy. He is happy. He is healthy. He had a great first year There'll be links in the show notes to his web comics that he's been doing. He was described by a gentleman in the industry who we all admire, Jeff Gomez, who's part of the reason that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a unified universe. Jeff Gomez read a bunch of stuff that Aaron had written and asked him if he had a, an image of himself as kind of a, a thematic writer. What kind of writing did he do? What kind of story was he attracted to? And Aaron was kind of baffled by that. And Jeff said, because it's, it's pretty clear looking at your work, you or at least your main characters are the bright lights in a dark world. And I thought, wow, I couldn't ask for more than for my firstborn to be that. And he does seem to be that to people in general, as well as in his writing. So it's, it's been a good year for him. And one of the nicer parts of our team's move to Philadelphia has been he's going to school in Philadelphia, so I can occasionally get out and get lunch with him and, and check on him during the year. And that's been really lovely, too. Thing two is done <clears throat> with his first year of high school and had a great time. I didn't know how he was going to do. And honestly, mid-year, Right, right around the time that the science team moved to Philly, uh, he started to have a hard time with homework and things like that. And then he, he just decided 
that he didn't really like getting lousy grades. And he was going to do what needed to be done to pull his grades up. I have never seen any kid figure themselves out this quickly. He figured out a couple of things. One, if he was at home, he would be too tempted to not do his work. So he started walking to a local Starbucks after school and doing all of his homework there. He did not call for a ride until he was done. So that worked really well. The second thing was he followed my husband's advice and never got a grade lower than his current GPA. So every grade either didn't budge the GPA at all or nudged it upwards. So he went from a 70 to an 89 in the course of four months, I think. I was impressed. I have to admit it. I don't know that I could have done that when I was his age. So he ended the year on a high note. He's taking AP classes next year. I am completely gobsmacked by this, but it's 100% his decision. There, there was no pushing him on my end at all. I just didn't want him to fall apart again. So he's having a good time. Husband Andrew is working away and still awesome. This October, it will have been 23 years of marriage. Wow. Time flies, man. And oh, the other kind of cool news at Christmas this year, instead of having Christmas at somebody's house, we took off my in-laws and my mom and my husband's cousins, a couple of my husband's cousins, we all took off with kids and went to Costa Rica to an eco lodge. I've never done anything like this before. It was incredible. It was a very eco-friendly place just in general. The whole place is solar, so like you couldn't leave things plugged in during the day because you were going to need to conserve your batteries, basically your what power was left for the nighttime. And it's a good thing that we did because one night I stepped on a scorpion. And by stepped on, what I mean is my foot got close to a scorpion before it recoiled in horror at the shock and pain of being hit by a scorpion's tail. It was a pretty big one, which is good. It was a good three, three inches long. The little ones are the deadly ones. Big ones, not deadly, but those suckers hurt. And it was about one in the morning and I couldn't get a hold of anybody, and my family sleeping, and we were the furthest cabin away from the main lodge, so it was almost a mile. There was no way I was going to walk all that way with a scorpion sting on my foot, so I stood on a frozen bottle of water, because I'd been keeping bottles of water in the freezer, (laughs) because it was hot in Costa Rica at Christmas time. I stood on the bottle of water for two hours while I read a book. And that's how I spent my Christmas vacation, kids. Uh, No, I actually did one other thing, which I will post on the show notes. The very first day there, my mom and I went rappelling down a waterfall. And I will share the video of me rappelling down a waterfall, because I did that. What else? I ran two 5Ks, because one of the things I was able to do at work was go in early and go to the gym. So that was cool. And I think that's it. The thing I haven't been doing is anything particularly crafty until fairly recently. I have just been so tired. Even knitting put me to sleep on the train because I was so tired. So in Costa Rica, I kept a watercolor journal. And that was great because I actually did keep track of what we did and when we did it which turns out to have been kind of useful in retrospect. Because, you know, you forget pretty quickly. And, and I also painted a picture of the scorpion. <laughs> Immortalized that little bugger. But I learned from Thing 2 that there is an iPad app called Procreate, which is hilarious. P-R-O-C-R-E-A-T-E. Uh, it is a painting app. Now I understand that Photoshop is coming out with an iPad app. That's just nifty. But in the meantime, Procreate was designed for the iPad. It is incredible. I think it might be $9 for the full version. And 
I have never been so impressed with an application for any device before or since. It just does exactly what you want it to do. There are video help things online. It has an extensive and really nicely written help guide manual that comes along with it. People have created hundreds and hundreds of brushes. So if there's any kind of brush you want, like foliage or grass or clouds, you can get a brush that will make clouds as you tap it across the screen. It's just incredible. So I've been trying to learn how to paint on the Procreate app water, which is a kind of meditative thing to do and also learn how to do. And I'm starting to work on translating that backwards into painting water with watercolors again. So that's been like really the only crafty thing I've done aside from survival. So I've been kind of boring that way. But you know what isn't boring? Treasure Island. How was that for a segue? Ha! I still got it. So Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson. Holy cow. In my lifetime pursuit of trying to include on Craftlet the books that everybody thinks they know, but really probably not so much. Treasure Island rates pretty high up there. Not as far as Frankenstein, but close. My husband and his father had a relationship surrounding Treasure Island in that I can't remember how many times he said this happened, but as a child, Andrew would listen to his father read Treasure Island to him. And his dad would get as far as the first couple of chapters with Long John Silver, where he got to do his R I and all that stuff. And then he would slowly peter out and never finish the book. So I don't know how many times they started it and got to Long John Silver, which was clearly a goal <laughs> for my father-in-law. And then it just kind of all tanked. We, however, in the car several years back, as a family, boys and I and, and Andrew listened to an audible version of Treasure Island read by Alfred Molina, who did an extraordinary job. But I have gone looking for this version and it doesn't exist anymore. I don't understand and I am heartbroken. But we listened to it and it was great and everybody was so surprised because it wasn't what they expected. I mean, it was. It's a treasure hunt story. It's a pirate story. It's, in fact, the pirate story that has defined pirates for us ever since. It is extraordinary in the same way that Dracula is. You can never say the word vampire without somehow ringing that Dracula bell. And you really can't say pirate without ringing the Long John Silver Bell, or the Jack Sparrow Bell, but that's that's a little bit newer. But originally, before Jack Sparrow, it all came down to Long John Silver. And then you add to that two filmed versions of the story. You have a 1934 Wallace Beery Long John Silver, who's got the parrot and the growly voice, and he's classic. And then you've got the 1950, 54 version with Robert Newton, and he's the R I guy. And I have a couple of YouTube clips on the show notes that you can watch to see, to see how to talk like a pirate. But these character actors have codified what we expect from pirates. And because of that, when Johnny Depp did Jack Sparrow, he took that trope and put his own twist on it and maintained his pirateness while also being, at least in the first movie, hilariously funny. And curiously enough, I guarantee you, not on accident, because the guys who wrote Pirates of the Caribbean are the same guys who wrote Aladdin, not on accident, Jack Sparrow turns out to be not who you think he is, as far as morals and ethics go. It's a bit of a movable feast for him, sure. He is a pirate, after all. But just like Jack Sparrow surprises you in Pirates of the Caribbean, Long John Silver will surprise you in Treasure Island. 
So how did this all come about? There are lots of stories about how Robert Louis Stevenson wound up writing this book. Most of them are at least in part true. He had an interesting life, and we will get into more of his life as we go through the book. He wound up far from Scotland in San Francisco, living with a woman who had been married and had a son from that earlier marriage. Her son, Lloyd Osborne, was about 12 years old when he and RLS, Robert Louis Stevenson, were sitting at a kitchen table and creating a treasure map, a story. Stevenson was, as we know from Jekyll and Hyde, very good at making up stories. And as they created the treasure map, they started to create the story. And it wasn't very long before Robert Louis Stevenson just wrote the whole thing down. It was a hit, not surprisingly, from the get-go. Now, the thing that might be interesting to you is it was published in 1881. It does not even remotely take place in 1881. The golden age of piracy really happened somewhere between 1720 and 1750. And there's several reasons to believe that this book is taking place somewhere between 1740 and 1750. This was an interesting time to be on the ocean. Sailors were generally paid poorly. And so if they were boarded and taken over by pirates who weren't particularly bloodthirsty, many of them wound up signing on with the pirates. Because if you're going to have a short, miserable life, at least you could get paid for it. <laughs> I, I think might have been some of the reasoning at that point. Plus, you know, if you joined with the pirates, at least you might not die. So in the 1700s, there was also a reason for there to be buried treasure lying around. And that was because, okay, you plunder, you loot, <laughs> you, you fulfill all of the requirements of the Pirates of the Caribbean song, and you wind up with a lot of stuff, and it's heavy, and you're on a boat. And even though a lot of the stuff seems like it would be easy to trade or trade out for cash or goods or necessary things, sometimes it was hard to find a fence. And oftentimes the ports that you were going to put into, or at least near to, were the same ports that the people who you just robbed were heading for. So trying not to get caught with the stolen goods was kind of important. As a consequence, pirates really did bury treasure on islands. Maybe not as much as the Count of Monte Cristo came into contact with, but certainly a treasure map with a location or three of where one might find buried treasure on a deserted island, there's every reason for that to have been real. So Robert Louis Stevenson was taking real history and real, true to life-ish activities, combining them with really, really well done and complicated characters. Some of them, of course, are, are cardboard cutouts. They're two-dimensional characters. You need those too. But when he focused in on characters, he really does a lovely job of making them complicated, not unlike what we saw him do in Jekyll and Hyde. Now, one of the main characters who we get to know right off the bat is young Jim Hawkins, and he's our, our narrator and our guide. We also learn in the very first sentence that he is very likely a trustworthy narrator. And why? Because this is the first sentence. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars about the treasure island from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace, 17, hmm, and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow Inn, and the brown old seaman with a saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. So first off, hey kids, that was one sentence. And hey adults, that was also the first entire paragraph. <laughs> so if a child ever says, Mom, can one sentence be a paragraph? The answer is, yes, dear, but only if you can write like Robert Louis Stevenson. So we find out from young Jim Hawkins that, number one, he's writing the story for us. Number two, Squire Trelawney, a respectable person, and Dr. Livesey, ooh, another respectable gentleman, have asked Jim to write the story down. They're not doing it. They want Jim to do it. Presumably, 
not because they want it to be woven through with falsehoods and fairy tales, but because they think he's going to do a good job. Squire Trelawney and Dr. Livesey very likely hold some place of position within their society. It is certainly possible that this story is intended to be public record. And we'll see more about how that could have played out shortly. And Jim being young, uh, we don't know how young yet, but young and evidently trustworthy. It doesn't take him very long to start weaving in terminology that comes straight out of the pirating trade. For one thing, Atari pigtail, T-A-R-R-Y. You would, if you were on board, you had uh, ropes that you had had to cut. For those of you who are spinners, these would have been cabled ropes. We know what would happen if you just cut a cabled rope instead of tying a knot at the end of it. It would uncable itself pretty quickly because those suckers are under high tension. They would tie a knot in it, sure, but also tar the end of the rope. Well, pirates also occasionally tarred their braids, the ends of their braids, or pigtails, so that they also wouldn't unravel. Kind of gross, but also kind of brilliant and useful, because you didn't have hair elastics back then. So, (laughs) the things you learn from these books. Capstan, one character's voice is described as high, old, tottering, He had a high, old, tottering voice that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the capstan bars. So a capstan is that big revolving, well, it's like a a tuning peg on a guitar, except it's on the deck of a ship. And you have those big wooden bars pushed into it, and people are pushing against the bars, reeling in, for example, an anchor. That's a capstan. Capstan bars are also called hand spikes. And... That's everything you need to know about that. I have a picture of that in the show notes as well. Sailing before the mast. A man who sails before the mast, in front of the mast, who lives under the deck in front of the mast, is not an officer or a gentleman, necessarily. So someone who sails before the mast is not the guy in charge. The Dry Tortugas are seven small islands west of Key West, Florida. And the Spanish Main, and ooh, I didn't know this, The Spanish Main is the body of the Caribbean, the part of the Caribbean waters that are closest to the north coast of South America. Of course, it makes sense that that's the Spanish Main, but it just didn't dawn on me before. Makes perfect sense now, though. Stevenson uses the word terrible in the sentence, uh, he was the sort of man that made England terrible at sea. He doesn't mean that England was lousy at doing seafaring things. He means terrible, like terrifying, like justifiably feared at sea. Um, He also talks about cocked hats. We've talked about this before, I think, that the tricornered hats that the sailors wore, they were rolled up on three sides, so you'd have to kind of train your hat. So if one of the cocks falls down, it's going to either get in the way of your eyesight, or it is going to let the rain run down some part of you. So it wouldn't be very effective if one of your cocks of your hat fall down. Powdered wigs, as you know, were powdered often with talc, so they were uh, kind of reflective and very, very white. And assizes, A-S-S-I-Z-E-S. Assizes are, if you've been watching Poldark, you have seen periodically that they have court trials, but they're not like a big courtroom with barristers and people wearing powdered wigs and stuff. It's your local magistrate who's handling all of the local issues. So you kind of only have to call assizes whenever you need to call an assize together. So they're they're periodic, but they are definitely courtroom related meetings. And I think that's everything we need before we head into chapter one of Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Adrian Pretzelis Santa Rosa, California, October 2007 To the Hesitating Purchaser If sailor tales to sailor tunes 
Storm and adventure, heat and cold, If schooners, islands, and maroons, And buccaneers and buried gold, And all the old romance retold, Exactly in the ancient way, Can please as me they pleased of old, The wiser youngsters of to-day. So be it, and fall on. If not, if studious youth no longer crave, His ancient appetites forgot, Kingston or Ballantine the brave, Or Cooper of the wood and wave, So be it also, and may I and all my pirates share the grave Where these and their creations lie. To Lloyd Osborne an American gentleman, in accordance with whose classic taste, the following narrative has been designed. It is now, in return for numerous delightful hours, and with the kindest wishes, dedicated by his affectionate friend, the author. Part One, The Old Buccaneer Chapter One, At the Admiral Benbow Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen, having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island, from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace, seventeen, hm, and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow Inn, and the brown old seaman with the sabre-cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I remember him as if it were yesterday, as he came plodding to the inn door, his sea-chest following behind him in a hand-barrow. A tall, strong, heavy, nut-brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred with dirty broken nails, and the sabre-cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cove and whistling to himself as he did so, and then breaking out in that old sea-song that he sang so often afterwards. Fifty men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, ho, and a bottle of rum, in the high old tottering voice that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the capstan bars. Then he rapped on the door with a bit of a stick, like a handspike that he carried, and when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum. This, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly, like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste, and still looking about him at the cliffs and up at our signboard. "'This is a handy cove,' says he at length, "'and a pleasant situated grog-shop. Much company, mate?' My father told him, no, very little company, the more was the pity. "'Well, then,' says he, "'this is the berth for me. Here, you, matey,' he cried to the man who trundled the barrow, "'bring up alongside and help up my chest. I'll stay here a bit,' he continued. "'I'm a plain man. Rum and bacon and eggs is what I want, and that head up there to watch ships off.' "'What you mun't call me? You mun't call me Captain. Oh, I see what you're at. There!' And he threw down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. "'You can tell me when I've worked through that,' said he, looking as fierce as a commander. And indeed, bad as his clothes were, and coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast, but seemed like a mate or a skipper accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrow told us the mail had set him down the morning before at the Royal George, that he had inquired what inns were along the coast, and hearing ours well spoken of, I suppose, and described as lonely, had chosen it from the others for his place of residence. And that was all we could learn of our guest. He was a very silent man by custom, all day he hung round the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in the corner of the parlour next the fire, and drank rum and water, very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to, only look up sudden and fierce, and blow through his nose like a fog-horn, 
and we and the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll he would ask if any seafaring men had gone by along the road. At first we thought it was the want of company of his own kind that made him ask this question, but at last we began to see he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman put up the Admiral Benbow, and now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol, he would look in at him through the curtained door before he entered the parlour, and he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, there was no secret about the matter, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day, and promised me a silver fourpenny on the first of every month, if I would only keep my weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg, and let him know the moment he appeared. Often enough, when the first of the month came round, and I applied to him for my wage, he would only blow through his nose at me, and stare me down, but before the week was out he was sure to think better of it, bring me my fourpenny piece, and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house, and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms, and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of a creature, who never had but one leg, and that in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over the hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares, and altogether I paid pretty dear for my monthly fourpenny piece in the shape of these abominable fantasies. But though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. There were nights when he took a great deal more rum and water than his head would carry, and then he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked old wild sea-songs, minding nobody. But sometimes he would call for glasses round, and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories, or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I have heard the house shaking with yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum, all the neighbours joining in for dear life, with the fear of death upon them, and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits he was the most overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on the table for silence all around. He would fly up in a passion of anger at a question, or sometimes because none was put, and so he judged the company was not following his story. Nor would he allow any one to leave the inn till he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. His stories were what frightened people worst of all. Dreadful stories they were about hanging and walking the plank, and storms at sea, and the dry tortugas, and wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. By his own account he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea, and the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. My father was always saying the inn would be ruined, for people would soon cease coming there to be tyrannised over and put down, and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but on looking back they rather liked it. It was a fine excitement in a quiet country life, and there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a true sea-dog, and a real old salt, and such like names and saying there was the sort of man that made England terrible at sea. In one way, indeed, he bade fair to ruin us, for he kept on staying week after week, and at last month after month, so that all the money had been long exhausted, and still my father never plucked up the heart to insist on having more. If ever he mentioned it, the captain blew through his nose so loudly that you might say that he roared and stared my poor father out of the room. 
I have seen him wringing his hands after such a rebuff, and I am sure the annoyance and the terror he lived in must have greatly hastened his early and unhappy death. All the time he lived with us the captain made no change whatever in his dress but to buy some stockings from a hawker. One of the cocks of his hat having fallen down, he let it hang from that day forth, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. I remember the appearance of his coat, which he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which, before the end, was nothing but patches. He never wrote or received a letter, and he never spoke with any but the neighbours, and with these, for the most part, only when drunk on rum. The great sea-chest none of us had ever seen open. He was only once crossed, and that was toward the end when my father was far gone in a decline that took him off. Dr. Livesey came late one afternoon to see the patient, took a bit of dinner from my mother, and went into the parlour to smoke a pipe until his horse should come down from the hamlet, for we had no stabling at the old Benbow. I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrast, the neat, bright doctor, with his powder as white as snow, and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners, made with the coltish country folk, and above all that filthy, heavy, bleared scarecrow of a pirate of ours, sitting far gone in rum, with his arms on the table. Suddenly he, the captain that is, began to pipe his eternal song. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, ho, and a bottle of rum, drink and the devil have done for the rest, yo-ho-ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. At first I had supposed the dead man's chest to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room, and the thought had been mingled in my nightmares with that of the one-legged seafaring man. But by this time we had all long ceased to pay any particular notice to the song. It was new that night to nobody but Dr. Livesey, and on him, I observe, it did not produce an agreeable effect, for he looked up for a moment quite angrily before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener, on a new cure for rheumatics. In the meantime the captain gradually brightened up at his own music, and at last flapped his hand upon the table before him in a way we all knew to mean silence. The voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Livesey's. He went on as before, speaking clear and kind, and drawing briskly at his pipe between every word or two. The captain glared at him for a while, flapped his hand again, glared still harder, and at last broke out with a villainous oath. "'Silence there between decks!' "'You were addressing me, sir?' said the doctor, and when the ruffian had told him with another oath that this was so, replied, "'I have only one thing to say to you, sir, that if you keep on drinking rum the world will soon be quit of a very dirty scoundrel.' The old fellow's fury was awful. He sprang to his feet, drew and opened a sailor's clasp-knife, and, balancing it open on the palm of his hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so much as moved. He spoke to him as before over his shoulder, and in the same tone of voice rather high, so that all the room might hear, but perfectly calm and steady. "'If you do not put that knife this instant into your pocket, I promise, upon my honour, you shall hang at the next assizes.' Then followed a battle of looks between them, but the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a beaten dog. "'And now, sir,' continued the doctor, "'since I now know there's such a fellow in my district, you may count I'll have an eye upon you day and night. I'm not a doctor only, I'm a magistrate, and if I catch a breath of complaint against you, if it's only for a piece of incivility like tonight's, I'll take effectual means to have you hunted down and routed out of this. Let that suffice." Soon after Dr. Livesey's horse came to the door, and he rode away. 
but the captain held his peace that evening, and for many evenings to come. End of chapter one. Ah, uh, Dr. Livesey. Dr. Livesey, I love when Billy Bones just starts railing on him in the inn. And the next line, beginning of the next paragraph, is the doctor never so much has moved. That tells us an awful lot about Dr. Livesey. Steady. Steady on there. I think that pretty much sums him up. Billy Bones? Not so much. Billy Bones, he's having some trouble. Having issues. And Jim, yum Jim Hawkins, he's pretty honest there about his dad. And the inn. And his life. And it's reasonable to expect that he's somewhere around 12 or 13, the same age that young Lloyd Osborne was when he and Robert Louis Stevenson were drawing the treasure map. That's not surprising. Jim Hawkins would have been expected to take over the Admiral Benbow Inn, so he would have been educated from early on in all of the things he would need to know, mathematics, how to read and write, basic upkeep of the house. So the idea that a 12 or 13-year-old boy would never have done any of the things that we are about to see him do in this book just doesn't hold water. It makes perfect sense, especially in 1740, 1750, that he would have been expected to be a man in all but stature at this point. So we have our start of the book, and I made it to a microphone, and you got to catch up with me, and that's pretty cool. And on that note, I will leave you. Next week, I hope against hope that I will get back to the microphone and get you Chapter 2 of Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Have a great one. Talk to you later. Bye. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review at iTunes or like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or any one of a million different places that Craftlet wound up over the last 13 years. For more information on Craftlet, you can visit craftlit.com and subscribe via your favorite podcast app or download the Craftlet app so you can get all of your episodes right there in your hand, all in one place without having to hassle with anything else. So you can be sure not to miss any of Treasure Island. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Thanks. Thanks.